Could you talk just briefly about um, what role the department plays with the agencies in uh, developing the rulemaking and the guidance, or then in working with Congress on the legislative fixes? Sure, and, and it's different with respect to the 404 program okay. uh, because of the Supreme Court involvement in okay. the matter, which gives the Department of Justice a greater role both uh. with respect to rulemaking and with respect to legislation than we would normally have. I mean, for other environmental statutes, uh, you know, there's coordination with the Department of Justice just like there's coordination with a wide range of federal agencies, uh, OMB and, and others. Um, with respect to both rulemaking and legislation, we have a process for reviewing proposals, and uh, it's not my section that does it, uh, and often it's not even the Environment Division. Uh, you know, there's a, an Office of Legislative Affairs that, that works on matters that are on the Hill. Um, but with respect to Clean Water Act legislation and rulemaking, it's different because the issues that we're confronting now are the result of these Supreme Court decisions. So, uh, and, and that's been one of the truly enjoyable parts of, of my job. I've been lucky enough to, uh, to, to be involved in these uh, broader issues. And, um, you know, for, the, for those couple of years when legislation looked like it was actually a possibility, uh, uh, we did work with uh, congressional staffs, uh, committee staffs on both the House and Senate side uh, to think about approaches to the Clean Water Act and, and uh, how to have the best statute possible uh, within Congress's authority uh, under the Commerce Clause and under the Property Clause and under the uh, their uh, ability, their uh, ability to tax, um, right, right. And, and and treaties, international treaties. That would be another source of congressional power. So there was a lot of thinking uh, there, and and we had a we had a work group within the environment division that consisted of attorneys from the enforcement section and my section, uh, our law and policy section, and the appellate section. Uh, and we all work together, uh, not not just to develop legislation, but and we weren't developing legislation; we were right. really just uh, right. consulting with, with the committee right. staffs. But um, but there was a lot of other coordination that we needed to do after Rapanos because no one knew what that decision meant and how it was going to play out. So we put this working group together to uh, coordinate on the litigation side uh, so that we would have consistent positions uh, and that all the relevant entities that might be litigating cases were, were being consistent and coordinating with each other uh, because U.S. attorneys were handling cases, other uh, different sections within the Environment Division were handling cases uh, right. under the Clean Water Act, uh, other agencies other than EPA and Corps of Engineers had matters that were affected by the scope of, of, uh, of the Clean Water Act. So we put this committee together to, to coordinate all our briefs and to make sure we spoke with a, a unified voice. And, and we had, I'd say in the five years after upon us, maybe 75 briefs that were filed in district and appellate courts. And, and um, we, we were able to, to make sure that that we weren't contradicting ourselves uh, right. when we were filing those briefs. But we had this group together, so when legislation was being developed, that was the group that naturally uh, served some, some role with the uh, congressional committees in, in drafting the legislation. Not, not to the same extent as EPA, of course. That was right. the primary agency that was involved. But we had fun for a while. <laughs> while it lasted. So. While it lasted, and that wasn't very long because yeah. it's so controversial right. that even with Democratic control of the House and of the Senate uh, and of the White House, uh, there still was, as it turned out, no chance 
or legislation to pass. We, we couldn't even, on the Senate side, there was a, a, a draft piece of legislation that actually did get through the committee, uh, but it never came to the floor. On the House side, it, it never even got through. The, I don't think it was even presented to the relevant committee. Um, so when that effort died out and it became apparent that there would not be a legislative fix, um, then the focus was on the regulatory side. And EPA has, along with the Corps of Engineers, has been working on a regulatory uh, proposal for, for many years now. And, and that's uh, uh, been, been a very difficult process. And, and, the, and they're really limited in what they can do. I, I said before that Congress could ignore Rapanos because, because it right. was about congressional intent. Right. So Congress could do whatever it wanted. But in issuing a regulation defining waters in the United States, it had to be within the parameters set up by Rapanos. So I think the, the, the main consequence of both the Swank and Rapanos decisions is that the focus cannot be on the wetlands themselves. That we cannot protect wetlands because of the functions and values that wetlands provide, which are many. As a result of Rapanos and Swank, we can only protect the wetlands where we can demonstrate that those wetlands have some uh, direct proximate relationship with the water quality of, of traditional navigable waters. Right. So wetlands that provide habitat for endangered species and are hugely valuable for that reason cannot be protected under the Clean Water Act unless you can show that that same wetland has some discernible relationship to the biological, chemical, and physical integrity of some traditional navigable water that might be 50, 100 miles away. 